Welcome to Authored by Us, a podcast celebrating children's books about characters of color or of different cultural experiences and the authors who bring these diverse works to life. Each week, we invite you to join us as we turn the pages of these bookshelf gems and hear from their creators who understand that stories of diverse experience truly come to life when authored by us. Here's your host, Zenzi Hodge. Greetings and welcome back, listeners. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Authored by Us. As a parent, I am used to having all kinds of conversations with my son. I remember having the, where do babies come from discussion when he was a lot younger. And the conversations today have changed to, how do I ask a girl out on a date? Either question can cause a bit of parental anxiety and makes me ponder. One, are we really having this conversation? Are you expecting me to answer this? And how do I answer this correctly? Because through all the angst, I'm still preparing to answer with a sense of responsibility and pride because after all, he did come to me. But then there's the talk that I had with my son that I didn't factor in. It came shortly after the murder of Trayvon Martin. And I had to explain why I was so sad over something that happened far from where we were, but still hurt like it was just next door. After the murder of Eric Garner, he questioned his father, who was in law enforcement, about why the police had hurt this man and looked for answers about why something like that happened. And I just longed for the days of where do babies come from? Because at this point, they seem somewhat simpler to tackle. This week's author is Michael A. Woodward Jr., And he joins us to share his book titled, The Talk, Conversations Between a Black Father and His Son. Now, while his book is a work of fiction, it confronts the reality of the conversations that have to be held. Michael is a former elementary teacher who has found himself back in the classroom as a PhD student at Barry University. And through his studies, he holds degrees from the Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University and the University of Las Vegas. He is inspired daily by his three sons and fiance, whom he credits as the sources of much of his motivation. Michael believes that one day, all children will have the opportunity to take advantage of a deserving and equitable education. And it is his belief that for this to be achieved, it begins with those who are like he is, educators. Thank you for joining us on the show, Michael, and welcome. I couldn't, I I just, I couldn't be more honored to be here. Uh, I'm thankful. Uh, how, How are you? Hey there. Happy Tuesday. (laughs) Happy Tuesday. I'm glad to have you here. Now, we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping in the very beginning because, you know, my introduction to you had a little bit more elaboration about one of your universities, the Mm -hmm. Florida Agricultural University. Oh, they heard it. Oh, they heard it. I know. If anyone missed it, I... I want to say it again, the Florida Agricultural Mechanical University. So you and I are proud Rattlers. We are family. So welcome. Thank you for being with with us here. Thank you for sharing your books. And thank you for bringing this Rattler love and pride that we know we all have to author by us. It's infectious. Uh, You know a Rattler. You know when a Rattler is in the room, is uh, in the group chat, uh, in the thread of emails. Our presence is known and I'm just so thankful. I, it was one of the greatest decisions of my life. <laughs> I, I'm with you about that. You know, I, I do. We say it all the time. We brag differently. And, and we do it for a reason. Because we know the greatness that comes from our alma mater. Yes, so ma'am. That, that's my piece of pride. <laughs> so <laughs> there is so much that I said about you in the introduction that as I as I stated it and I listened to myself, I'm like, wow, there is so much to unpack. And so I hope we have enough time to cover everything because there's so much that I want to be able to talk with you about, not just about this book, the talk, but about everything because you touch on education. So I'm going to pace myself. And so we're going to start right at the beginning. Tell us about your book, The Talk, Conversations Between a Black Father and His Son. That's my heart. Um, I wrote that at a in a really, really low place in my life. I remember exactly, you know, what caused, and I don't know exactly what will be the result of those words, the illustrations, the organic conversations, you know, um, taking the time to really kind of go back in life and reminisce on sitting atop my father's knee and going on long rides (laughs) in the car around the city, uh, just having conversation and picking up on so many gems that I didn't know were so priceless at the time. 
Well, unfortunately, it seems like conversations these days have to be just a little bit tougher and they have to be a little bit more mandatory. And in some cases, there are so many, you know, when you, when you think of the number of interracial couples that are out here and you think of the, 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 the beauty of diversity uh, within America, there are a lot of fathers who don't quite, who aren't black, you know, but yet they're raising black children, which is a beautiful thing, you know. So I, plainly put, I was tired of people asking me, you know, how, how do you, how do conversations with you and your sons go? You know, because I've got three sons, and 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 and, and these are three separate conversations, uh, but they all boil down to the same values and morals and ethics and rights and wrongs. You know, so I, I got tired of it because I feel like there are conversations that need to be had on every block, on at every dining room table, in every front to back seat, um, within the car, like whatever, every moment that there is to really share. You know, um, just the experience of what it means to become a man and to grow up, you know, and to face challenges and to be rooted in so many values that we don't quite pick up in books. See the, the, the see the irony in all of this? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, please, I don't wanna, I don't wanna take up all of your time. Ms. No, <laughs> it, it's not, it, you're, you're right. These are not always things that you find in the traditional books that we read. I remember several years ago, I was telling someone that my son and I, watch Blackish. We love Blackish because it has allowed me to have conversations with him about things I know we needed to discuss, but I wasn't really sure how we get to that point. And so when you when you have a book such as yours, it gives it gives an opening for a parent to have those conversations with their children. It gives an opening, it, you give them the words to discuss it. And when it's framed as a children's book, it draws the child in. Um, and I also like that you, you found a way to get that across. You gave some context for where we were, but it was also inspiring and affirming. It, it was not, it was not just focused on the, what happens, the bad, the pain of what happens, but you gave some, some history that came along with it. You talked about the Tuskegee Airmen. You know, I, I, <laughs> I gave love, them that love. I gave them that love. We got I love them. how you close with Malcolm X. So you gave oh you gave some context that was historical as well. So that as a parent is reading this to their child, they're they're teaching them some things and they're saying, even even though there are some trials and their tribulations, these are hard things that we're discussing. There's some there's some value and there's some greatness that I always want you to be able to see. I couldn't agree more, you know, and, and I learned in my days in the classroom as an educator, well, number one, you're forever an educator. I think we're all educators in some way. But in my formal days of being in the classroom, I remember, you know, we got to we gotta feed these children spinach covered in ice cream. <laughs> Give it to them. Give it to them in a way where they're caught off guard. And I knew from the very beginning of when I struggled as a reader, you know, when I struggled to find literature that aligned with my identity, my experiences. My, 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 the relevance of my culture. I knew that growing up that there was a void present. And I knew that as a man, that I had the resources and the tools and the confidence to make it happen as a result of all of my encounters with other black men who gave me that confidence, whether it was through my fraternity or there was through, you know, the few black male teachers I've ever had in my life, you know, and thankfully it was through my father. And there's 43% of America who grow up in fatherless homes, who don't have that organic conversation at the table. Like, well, what do you mean you got to see in biology? You think that's okay? Like, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these students, these kids are going without, and yeah. that's not, it's not how it needs to be. I shared with you and I, I explained this to people. Um, so my husband passed away three years ago. And so my son was 10. And so he has gone through his adolescence at a very critical point with not having his dad. And so the questions that he asks me are the questions that he would want to be able to ask his father. And so there are children, as you talk about fatherless homes, that there are some children that are without their father for various and sundry reasons. It could be to a parent passing away, or it could be to a parent not being present um, for whatever reason in that child's oh. life. Oh. We can, we can go down that path. Yeah. Because, and there's so much that's missing. 
Oh my gosh, there's so many untold stories, or as as therapists like to say, there's there's much to unpack there. <laughs> there's so much to unpack there mm -hmm. because while there are many many men who are tragically taken away from their mm -hmm. families, ripped apart. However, there are many many others. Mm -hmm who have gone down, who have chosen to go down paths where they yeah. made the conscious decision to make that effort to be a part or to to go the other way, you know, and, and, and whether that's through drugs or poverty or mm -hmm. poor choices or in the hands of other black men, mm -hmm. which then it's twofold. They got one going to jail, you got one going to the cemetery. Sure. So it's, it's, it's now, you know, through smartphone technology and camera body cameras that are on you know we, we get to see that it, it's not just us taking us out now let, let us yeah. not turn a blind eye but it, it's a slippery slope and i think the more that we equip our students and our young children with frederick Douglass said it best it's easy to repair broken children and broken men if we start at the beginning at, at the, the beginning. right like my grandma say at the right, at the right. we start at the right and we nip it in the butt mm -hmm. We teach them from the very beginning that, yo, we're not going to accept mediocrity. We're not going to just mm -hmm. allow you to be okay. You shall never be silent unless you're listening. If you're not listening, if you've heard enough, <laughs> please, I apologize. Please. But, <laughs> but in a lot of respects, we should all we should never be at a point where we've heard enough mm. because there's always something else that that we need to be able to get. We need to be able to glean. Result. And so in the last few months, I've had the occasion to interact with authors who have similarly themed books, but they are from a family perspective. So the family, whether it's the immediate family, the extended family, talking to the children about what they are seeing on TV, violence um, against, uh, against Black men and so forth. But your book is very specific. It's, it's a father and a son, and you, you can't mistake that. It is a conversation that a father needs to have with his son. And last summer, um, this was after the murder of George Floyd. Ooh. I had my son and a couple of his friends. Uh, they were reading. They did a book club and they were reading uh, Between the World and Me. Mm. And cool. one of the questions we asked them to answer before they had their discussions and their group was facilitated by another fam, you and Dr. William Ashanti Hobbs. He he got online and he talked with, it was about seven kids. And one of the questions we asked them before they got into the session was, has someone in your family had the talk with you? And so these were kids that were rising seventh, eighth, and ninth graders. And the number of children that stated that they had not had this talk surprised me. And I wondered, well, am I the only person that's talking to my kid? And I want, I wanted to know, are we talking to our children? What makes us have these conversations with them? If we're not having them, why are we not having them? But I'll ask you, when did you first have this kind of talk? And I, have you had this talk with your kids? And how do we make sure that other parents are doing the same? Because the world is, the world is not going to wait for us uh -uh. to share things with our children. Nope. So we have to prepare them. For the world, world that they're April. entering. Yeah. One of my most fondest memories about being an educator is the ability to foresee implications. Like to be able to like step in front of the eight ball. I know it's coming. I know, I know Anthony is not going to understand what it is that I'm trying to teach the entire class, all 29 of these third or fifth graders. You know, so how can I get in front of that? How can I mitigate that challenge that's before them? The same is with these conversations and the same is with our children. How can I mitigate that moment when that police officer pulls him over? How can I mitigate that decision to get out of the car knowing that your friends are going to make a really, really bad decision? How can I beat my sons, your sons, whatever young man I meet in the street, how can I beat him? to letting a sense of doubt fester in his mind. And to me, it was never enough. It was never enough. My 27 third graders, my about 30, 33 fifth graders, I loved it. I loved them. I loved every opportunity because it's a privilege. It is a privilege to be a part of a child's life. Yeah. But I knew that I had something much more 
to share with so many more people. And if I could indirectly impact children, whether they meet me or not, then I know I'd be paying my homage to this to this world. I'd be paying my rent, as Cassius Clay says, that, that, that what we have to do to live on this earth. And I understood that there's a message that we have to tell and we have to be very direct, yet very indirect with how we get our message across. So through the talk, I understood that it's a two-step problem. It's not only am I going to talk to this child? Are we talking? Our mothers talking? Our fatherless homes? Our grandmas talking? Our uncles stepping in? Are they talking? But Mrs. Hodge, what are they talking about? Mm -hmm. It's a two-step. So I wanted to make sure I, 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 I don't want to say romanticized, but I, I, I visualized and illustrated a legit father talking with his son, as simple yeah. as that sounds. I wanted to first show it that it's okay. And this is where these conversations happen. They can happen yes. on a rooftop with a bowl yeah. of popcorn. They can happen in the Chevy. They can happen on the way to school, like as soon as mama get out of the car. Like they happen all the time. Mm -hmm. But what is going on in these conversations? So I wanted to pinpoint and put a magnifying glass on the good and the bad. And yeah. I wanted to show through my illustrator, who is phenomenal, mm -hmm. that when we do look back at history, Sometimes it's in all red. Sometimes it's marred with blood. Mm. And I wanted to show the visual in the colors, but when it's a memory, sometimes it's hazy. <laughs> and these are the kind of conversations, it don't matter how hazy these conversations get with fathers and sons or stepfathers and sons or uncles and sons, they need to be had because if you're not talking to them, somebody on the street is going to talk to them. No doubt about it. Somebody's going to get them. Mm -hmm. And then you have no control over what's being said. Oh, that's that conversation. Oh, yeah. That's the two yeah. part. That's yeah. the two part about it. You have no control over that. But you also showed a lot of, of, of intimacy. Well, so I looked at it and it made me think of how my husband would talk with our son, you know? So you, you show a young boy there with his father. You said sitting on da your dad's knee and you showed closeness. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't show closeness. We'll show closeness between a mother and a son. I'm we won't always show closeness between a dad and his son, but it's something that needed to, to be shared. It showed care. It showed compassion. Um, and I think that you did a great job of showing the role of a black father in his child's life, participating actively and being caring in that participation. And I think that comes out very strongly um, in your writing. You know, really the, the role of black fathers, the role that black fathers play in your writing. Um, and I don't know if a young man in the book had a mom because we didn't really see her. And I wasn't bothered by that. I, you know, I, I wasn't bothered by that at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never, I'm not going to let you take me down that path. I never thought about that. She's there. Michelle Obama is there. She's got I saw Michelle, but this was not a book about mom. This was a book about dad and his son, and I, always, I was there for it. And you know, I think it might have caught me. And I, I, one day somebody's going to use this against me. But I always try to find a way to slip in dad. If you look at there's something about mommy. If you look at King Monty, you look at all of the other books through the window. There's always dad. He's always like there because you all are black queens and. You know, and, and it's it, it, it's never it's never it never gets old seeing you all seeing women in, in their entirety and their full essence, in their being. But it's a rarity to see black men. And it's heartbreaking because it's twofold, trifold, however way you want to cut it. You know, um, if you're in corporate America or if you're in the real world, if you're in education, you may go to work. You may not see a black man. You know, um, I've visited college campuses all over this country, whether for work or for school. And it's hard it is to admit, sometimes I've gone to some universities and the only black men I've seen are working, you know, picking up the leaves and taking plant. out the trash. And, and you do what you got to do. Times get hard. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't knock anybody for their hustle. But, you know, sometimes I wish I can fire off more emails to black professors. I wish I can build closer relationships with black deans you know, with black provosts and really get a better understanding of how do we continue to mitigate the inequities mm -hmm. present, whether it, we're talking of a child or a teenager or, you know, even at 20, 21, 22, we can still capture the hearts, emphasis on hearts and minds of mm -hmm. younger black men 
you know, in an effort to really create this change we wish to see, you know, um, yeah. Well, see, that, that leads me into something I was going to ask you about later. But as you talk about not having enough black males present in an academia, so I have a middle schooler and throughout his, the last six years, he has had one, two black male teachers, um, <laughs> and they both taught PE. Oh my gosh. We got to get you the so, book, man. We, I, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So oh. we're going to, we're going to talk about that because that is, that is something that I see all the time, but we're going to take a quick break and Let's we'll be right it. back. Let's do it. <laughs> like what you hear so far, make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button. Now authored by us is made possible by listeners like you. We thank you for your support. Now back to the show. So we're back with Michael Woodward. So Michael, before we broke, we were just about to talk about not having enough black men in the classrooms. And I recently spent some time with alumni from, from a school, a high school that is uh, predominantly white. And we were having a conversation about that very matter, that they did not see enough black people in the classroom. In fact, they said in a school where there weren't a whole lot of black students, the only other black person that they identified with, that they had a relationship with was the person who worked in facilities and who did work around the school. And that was like a punch to my heart. And I was like, how heartbreaking that must be. I had another parent tell me that when her son was younger at school, he saw just the folks that were cleaning the school and they were all black. And he asked his mom, you know, Ma mom, can black men be teachers? So not having enough black men in the classroom is something that really pains me because I have a black son. But because you and I both attended an HBCU, we're products of these schools, and we know that they have education programs. What role do you see our HBCUs playing in making sure that they're developing the next generation of black teachers and particularly the next generation of black male teachers? I wanna say, first and foremost, HBCUs set, set the standard for the inclusive community that needs to coexist in academia. I think far too often, you know, members of the now majority, you know, we were once the minority, but children of color, you know, are forced to operate with a sense of finding refuge again in facilities management. Someone who's mopping the floor, somebody who's, you know, who's only in and out of their life for just a moment to break a sweat, you know, or and climb a rope and ring a bell. And that's cool because th they're those inorganic, those organic conversations between, you know, father figures and fatherless students can coexist. That's what's up. But it needs to happen in a much deeper level of efficiency, you know, and, and, and just far too often, I believe this role is skewed and, and students are, are, are without seeing themselves in the light that they need to see. And that's exactly what HBCUs provide to knowing that, okay. I know, you know, I have to, I have to coexist alongside campus safety, campus police. You know, I know I have to uh, coexist with, you know, financial aid and all of these people who, mm -hmm. whether we look the same, sound the same or not, I still need to figure out how to get ahead. I still need to figure out how to get my financial aid going. So I think it not only provides this sense of security, but it gives us this edge of knowing that like, all right, even if we're on the same team, and they got their best interest in me, I still got to take care of business because of the prestige and the expectation level that's held about within the classroom or within these certain departments that you've got to go through, you know, in HBCUs. So through that, I grew and I evolved and I learned that, like, yeah, I'm not going to take no for an answer. Like, there's always a back door. I just got to find there's the back always door. Solution. Like, I just got to find a gatekeeper. I got to figure out what I'm good at. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I got to really hone in on like, all right, we got to, we got to create this sense of warmth, get somebody to buy into what it is that I'm selling in this moment. I'm selling my good nature, kind heartedness and my scholarly ways because I need to enroll in classes and I got this hold on my account. So however <laughs> way we cut, cut it or spin it, HBCUs provide that safe haven, you know, and, and, and I, I wouldn't have had it any other way. I think they teach you how to, how to navigate, 
You know, when you mentioned having a hold, I thought about that too. I, I had my share of holes, but you knew that you needed to take this class. And there's all your, there is that expectation that someone who looks at you as if you are in fact their child, they have an expectation of you in that classroom that you are here for a reason. And I'm going to make sure that you deliver on what you are supposed to to be successful, not just in this class, but in this world. And so you're right. They have, they have high expectations for their students as they should. Um, and if you have ever fallen short of one of your professor's expectations, um, the look or the chiding you receive is uh, pretty equal to that of your parent. Oh yeah. And you know that you have fallen short and oh, that yeah. you need, you need to do, you need to operate accordingly. So in, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to continue to go down, you know, um, what needs, what needs to be talked about when students are weighing the uh, their options and that's not mm -hmm. to step on the necks of any other uh institutions or opportunities for students but students need to they need to know they need to be they need to get the full scope of what's in front of them as they make one of the greatest decisions of their lives mm -hmm. and that's post k through 12 experience because that chapter is going to close and another one's going to open and i think our viewers and, and our listeners they need to know that students the ball is in their court it is not in their parents court it is not in, I mean, now if their mom and dad are paying, and I'm, I'm pretty certain Perhaps. they got a good, they got a good stake in that uh, stakeholder. But yeah. at the same time, you know, children or you know, our students need to fully understand like what comes about from the HBCU experience. And, you know, with it, not, they're, they're, there's nothing wrong with diversifying your resume, you know, in, in terms of where you went to school. And it's not about putting all your eggs in one basket. Because you can hop. I'm not saying yeah. continue to transfer, do what you got to do, but you get one degree from one university, you get that master's or that other degree or that terminal degree at a third and entirely different university. That's correct. So then you're you're playing the gambit. So when people try to step to you and say like, oh, well, one is better than the other. And, yeah. this, and we can have a more grounded conversation. Based on some facts. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's there's something else that you mentioned in your book, and as we we're talking about what we get from our HBCUs is a historical context mm -hmm. um, and some perspective of things oh, that yeah. we may have been taught differently. Mm -hmm. And so, as I was reading your book, I think one of my favorite parts, aside from the ending, which I told you I I really enjoyed, uh, because it it took me by surprise, but it made so much sense. Ooh, I was happy. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but my my second favorite piece really was your segment talking about the great sphinxes at Giza. And you took us to Africa and it really made me think of Naza's song, you know, I know I can, mm -hmm. because he talks about what happened with the nose. And I remember sharing that with someone some years ago and they, you know, they didn't know what happened to the Sphinx's nose. And so it you, you gave some historical context. You cleared up a little bit of miseducation. And you didn't have to do that in your book. And I'm glad that you did. But how important do you think it is that we not only tell our children about their history, but that we also clear up any miseducation oh. or misinformation that they've received? Oh, there's like 50 million ways I can go with that question. Uh, <laughs> Number one, let's address the absence, the absence of not necessarily the truth, but just the absence of the story itself. You know, I was just in Chicago this past weekend. I love Chicago. There's so much history. But oddly, it had me thinking about when we were in Alabama for my uncle's wedding uh, back in the fall under COVID protocol, of course. <laughs> but when you live, you know, when you live, when you live in the South, more specifically, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, and you're in the deep South. You know, I asked myself, like, man, I wonder how many hanging trees I've just driven by, you know, and, and, and it's the fact that we have sometimes no historical context to things that we encounter each and every day. So it's actually a bit of a curse that mm -hmm. I learn the truth in things more specifically, let's say the Sphinx, the Sphinx, you know, seeing and, and really understanding that, oh, that's not through erosion. That didn't just naturally happen. No. That nose was shot off because it highlighted the beautiful contours of the African American. That, that, that were distinctly African. I, it, yeah. 
I had to. And it's always a joy. Everybody thinks an author is just, oh, I just got to get my words down. Like, no, you are an orchestra. It is a, a band. You are, you are, a, a, yeah. I say that to say because you're battling your emotions and you're battling, you know, I wrote the talk twice. I was waiting for you to ask me, like, how it even came about. But you're fighting so many demons. Yeah. If you're truly putting, like, you know, there's, I, I'm not going to like talk about other people's work, but I think growing up, there were so many mm -hmm. books that I read that you can clearly, it's like, yo, did you experience this? Or are you telling me this through the eyes of someone else? Or, like, children can feel that. Is it real? Is it authentic? Or not am so just, much as, am, am I, am I sending, selling you a fairy tale? Exactly. Not so much yeah. as, it, did it happen? We all know a lot of these the ASAP's fables didn't happen, the ant and the grasshopper, but we understand the intent and we understand where it came from. And I think there was, again, this absence mm -hmm. of children of color being represented in a way that was respected. I got tired of us being the villain. I got tired of being the antagonist. I got tired of being the sidekick. You know, was that it a is particular time? Was it a particular incident that drove you to write this book? And I know you said you wrote it twice, but was there something in particular that led you to write the first time? And then what brought about? It was, um, yeah, two? the death of George Floyd. They were going crazy on CNN. Don Lennon was talking so spicy, but I was just loving, I, I was, I was loving it in a way that it was so raw. And, and then there were, there were other guests and they were interviewing protesters and you saw it and you felt it. And I feel like being a black man sometimes is very, very just a constant beat down mm -hmm. of camera footage and, and, and testimony and story after story. And then, you know, you see sometimes it's us taking our own lives, you know, mm -hmm. through mental health and, you know, the absence of support services and counseling that's needed. And it's heartbreaking. But where it came from, I just I got tired of watching CNN. I think I watched it till like two in the morning and then something just came over me and I was like, yo, how I feel, I'm going to just, just go because coupled with how are these conversations with your sons and how are these conversations? With, what do you talk about? And, and I know my conversation is different than your conversation. It's like, clearly lady, clearly, yeah. you know, and, and, and I'll share, I'm an open book. I'll share with you some of the main things that, you know, me and my sons hit on when we hold these conversations mm -hmm. or what is the focal point in my mind you know so I, I wrote it i gave i gave my iphone notes all i had i went outside to get some fresh air to catch the moon i came back you know you always let your writing cool you know you let it cool off because you'll approach it with entirely different set of eyes even though 20 minutes ain't much of letting it cool i come back i get back into it my eyes are dancing from burning buildings to my iphone screen and right back to crying and right back to like really questioning myself like is this because sometimes i get too like a little too dark and and i'm trying to really work on that but when i said black men are dying in the streets i need you to explain it more slowly yeah these are the conversations that children are asking their parents like why are we dying in the streets so frequent and so often what is going on and i swiped and it was gone all of it the entire manuscript was gone oh. i i swiped with my thumb and I, I was so into it, I never, like, saved it, and it just went away. Because even when I took a break and went outside, I didn't close out of the note. I just, you know, locked the phone, and I came back to it, da-da-da, and it was gone, and I cried again that night. I was like, man, oh, man, I had something there. Couldn't sleep, woke up. I literally, like, just laid there with my eyes open for hours, and I was like, it's still there. I can still feel it, and we went right back out on the porch, and it just all came back to me. And I think it came back even better, you know, so I can't tell you the big difference between draft one and draft two, but I can tell you that they both occurred and they happened before the sun came up that next morning. And yeah. But you were writing with purpose and you were oh, writing from your gosh. heart. So that's why, that's, that's why I came back. And I look at the time that we are recording this. So we are recording about a week after the conviction of the former police officer who murdered George Floyd almost one year ago today. And if we look at what has happened, if we are looking at CNN, uh, we're keeping up with the news, as that, that piece of that chapter was closed, then we had another incident. And then we had another incident. And we had another incident. And it's, <laughs> it's so much. 
you're talking about this so much. How do we move from the talk to the taking of action? Because I know that my son and I, we've talked about, we talked about George Floyd and we, 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 we talk about everyone because the news comes directly either into your TV, comes to your phone, and our kids are consuming that. They talk about it in their classes. But the natural thing is going to be, well, what do we do now? What do we do next? Because we can't just continue. We can talk to educate and inform. But how, where do we go from just talking about it? We hold one another accountable. It, it, it begins, it you know, you want to say it begins with a child, but it really begins with whom that child crosses paths with. So we must hold our black men accountable and all men and women as well. But let's just call a spade a spade. If we're talking about the flower and the blossoming of a young black child, it's going to take <laughs> a black father or a male or a figure of some sort to step in in his light and in his path to really press upon right from wrong. And it ain't about being their friend. And it's not about, yo, let's buddy, buddy up. Like, that's cool. That's great. It comes with it. But more importantly, it's a, it's a, hey, my guy, that's not, nah, man, pick your feet up when you walk. Or like, yo, let me, let me help you with that tie right quick. Or this is hat you have indoors. Or I was watching, oh, I don't even want to say, but just knowing that, a woman deserves a chair like bruh like can we get this lady a chair it was two european yeah. leaders i can't think of the name but they had this lady standing and i guess because she wasn't necessarily in charge and these were like presidents and they didn't even get her a chair until like 20 30 minutes and she expressed how lonely she felt in that moment of just being a woman so it was beautiful to be able to implement nefertiti within you know um the talk conversations between a black father and his son it was so heartwarming to put in Michelle Obama, you know, alongside Barack. Like, yeah, like, yeah, I want to put Barack in there, but I want people to know that yeah. there is a strong woman a snack right next to, if not in front of that black male that you seek refuge in. And if, and if that thought passes that child by, that's a problem. So, yeah, we crescendoed to that, like, undertaking of an ending that I wanted to give them. But I also made sure that I coded it with love and the appreciation of the black woman or the woman in the place of, you know, that space or that holding in their lives. Um, so, I, 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 yeah, it was the fastest. It, it never I, it just literally spilled out writing this book. And um, it took the longest too. it, it took outside of the novel. It took a long time illustrations wise because we wanted the history to be on point. The Tuskegee mm -hmm. Airman, you know, um, uh, the, 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 the the Sphinx, all of these different things. Yeah. You know, and all you these different pages. brought in Langston Hughes and Huey P. Newton. Oh, yeah. Oh, we had to. Little you MLK. Can't even better than that. And I didn't oh, want to yeah. just put MLK and, you know, at the podium. I wanted people to see MLK like, no, nah, this is how they did this, man. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and mixing in a little bit of modern time. I had the I Am a Man. The Birmingham sanitation strike. It's all of these little things that we see that we just don't really know. So even since I like, you know, grew and learned throughout the making of that book, I find myself seeing murals or seeing things on TV or in, you know, in um uh, out on the streets and murals here in Miami, and I'll mm -hmm. see like I am a man, or or you get to you pick up on these little things, or you make the connection to Red Tails to the Tuskegee movie and. You know, you see these real life experiences and that that is where academia kicks in. So the more that we can like build children in a way that they can see their own success, I, that's the key. If we can get more and more black men to get out here and teach children to read and tell children like, bro, it's, it's OK. You can be emotional, bro. You can bust that tear yeah. out right quick. It's all right. But you better wipe it off and you, let's keep it moving. And. You hold your head up high, like, and sometimes it's needed much more than just in recess or, you know, in the weight room or, yeah. you know, on a basketball court. That's yeah. needed in that time of strife when they're trying to figure out a two-step equation or when they're yeah. trying to figure out how to put together a five-paragraph essay. Mr. Wood, I don't really know what a thesis is. All right, let's sit down. Let's talk about your three supporting details. You know, tell me why you like this one particular snack out of the corner store. You know, break it down in a way where it's relevant. 
to what it is that they go through. And in so many moments, children are faced to leave their experiences in the parking lot at parent Ooh. pickup. They, they, they can't bring in their culture, what they heard in the music, what they ate for dinner last night, a specific type of seasoning or a specific type of jargon that their mom uses. Mm. So often than not, children are faced to have to be the translator at home and be the one who talks to the bill collector because their parents don't speak English. So I, I can do this all day, you know, and yeah, wow. it's, yeah. Wow. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. You're listening to Authored by Us. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review so you never miss an episode. Now back to the show with your host, Zenzi Hodge. All right, we're back with Michael Woodward. So Michael, I saw a photo on your website and you have packages of books in your hands. And I realized that you're delivering packages that are filled with all of your books. So it's not just the talk. You have many, many books. So can you tell us about all of the books that you have in your inspired collection? I think first and foremost, all the credit goes to the Lord, you know, just for being able to be a vessel and to get my thoughts out in a way or someone even cares, you know, <laughs> or, you know, in a, in a way that really sp sp spills truth, you know, so currently um, I'm sitting on the cusp of releasing my eighth, my eighth book with, it's been about probably 17, 18 months um, where we've released all of these, all of these different pieces of literature, pieces of my heart. Um, from, you know, chapter books to, you know, picture books uh, for pre-K and kindergarten all the way up to, you know, eighth grade, a little bit of ninth grade, you know, but I write in a way where uh, the adults need to take part into what's going on because I'll set that tone in that conversation starter that needs to be had with unequivocally white, black, Hispanic. I write in a way where everyone has a seat at the table. And everyone is able to find just something that should be salient to what it is that they are currently experiencing or what they've realized or witnessed someone else experiencing. You know, so from there, something about mommy, which really, really drives home the love between a mother and her son <laughs> with so much love and admiration to my beautiful chocolate dark skinned women who I feel like do not get their day, do not get the flowers that they deserve. You know, so I definitely slipped that in in a way. But from putting young black boys on the covers of my literature within Forever a Scholar, yeah. putting over two, three hundred books on the back cover and the front cover of the book, and really showing that diversity and that swath of opportunity is out there and available to be whatever it is that you want to be. And again, remember, it's about students being able to see what they can be. Yeah. So if I can continue to position my literature in a way where students can see not only what they're currently going through, but how to overcome it through the lens of someone like King Monty, I know I've hit my target because I'm not going to just give you, you know, what it is, the answer. I'm going to show you my notes. I'm going to show you Monty's thinking or whoever the main character in the book is so that you can take a moment, take a pause and figure out how to overcome whatever adversity is in your life or within a child's life. You know, and I know that a lot of kids do summer reading. Mm -hmm. And um, I look at the books that my son is reading and he reads them because he has to for class and he enjoys reading and this is for class. But when he opens certain books, so he has books from some of the authors we featured. He'll have your books pretty soon, but he gets such a joy when he sees a book oh, yeah. with someone on the cover who looks like him mm -hmm. or who's talking about an experience he's had. And if the author is a black male, oh, that that's it. He is, he's over the moon. And that, that makes such a difference. So one, you have a fan, but two, how do we get books like yours to be a part of the curriculum in our schools right oh now. Oh my God. Because the classics are important, yes, but there is something that is, and you said it earlier, you know, that they they really need to be able to see who they are, where they are in the books that they're reading. So how do, how do we get that to happen? Through vulnerability, you know, and countless conversations. Um, 
I'm someone, once you break the ice with me, you, you, you're not going to be able to shake me loose unless I'm just caught up in dissertation writing or caught up in writing the next book that I hope lands in the hands or laps of some parent or child. Once, once the outreach is, once the interest has been shown or once that door has cracked open, I'm kicking it in, you know, case in point, you know, got a beautiful price quote that was sent out on behalf of Broward County schools, you know, 5,000 role models. So it's, it's just really continuing to build relationships and show that how this is such a need. It's such so very much a necessity within a child's cognitive development. They must see themselves in a light that unfortunately is rarely shown. And that's no matter whether we're talking about movies or sports and entertainment or within literature of their own, whether it's from the library or, you know, from a one dimensional classroom. I think we must continue to juxtapose children in a way where their identity is championed and their culture is revered. Because if we continue to close them out of their history, it will be lost. It will be lost. We cannot live in a lifetime where just oral history is enough. It is insufficient. I love hearing my grandma tell me some stories that I don't even believe my daddy did. But I know that if it is not in a book, or if she doesn't have that photo album, or if she didn't write down that macaroni and cheese recipe, it will get lost. And we cannot. Matter of fact, we will not let the context of the African diaspora be lost within casual conversation and missed opportunities. We will not. Yes, that, that is, a, that's, that, that's so important. I mean, you're right. Whether it's, whether it's a recipe or whether, whether it's our history, um, you know, children need to understand the everything that, that, that is, that is them, you know, their parents' history, the, the funny and, you know, yeah, they're not the so sad. good. It's okay. Yeah. Lay it on me. Why does, you know, why does my dad have that little scar on his lip? Oh, <laughs> playing with electricity. Uh -huh. Like, oh, okay. As and, and you learn it. And oh, yeah. You, you, you start to have develop this connection like, oh, he makes mistakes. Oh, That's my right. dad really isn't invincible. He's a real man. And that is what I hope to one day become. Okay. So I know that through his missteps, and I know that because he was vulnerable, and in control of his emotions in a way that it taught me to be okay with battling my demons and addressing the conversations that need to be held. And it's just a cyclical effect. Things that I will pass down to my son and countless other black or brown or white children who I may never even meet again or to begin with. But that you will leave an impact on. Oh Absolutely. Gosh. Yeah. It's a privilege to live to live on nightstands across this country, and and I'm I'm just forever <laughs> grateful and forever thankful to even be considered to be brought into people's homes. I, I cannot tell you enough. Now you didn't start out intending to be a teacher. You got your bachelor's degree in business administration, and then your master's in education. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. did that happen? Oh, it was that that too was a slippery slope. It, it, was, it was just my experiences, man. Like, it was my my willingness to just do everything I could for my fraternity. A proud member, the initiator of the Beta New Chapter of Alpha Phi Fraternity Incorporated. And throughout that time, I was looking for my place in the frat. Like, what was I good at? You know, I knew my line brother is good at money. My other line brother is good at marketing. Another one is good at this. And I'm like, all right. About half or a little over half of us are in the same major. So we all can't be like the business people of the org. And that's where I found my place within community service because that's when I really saw it come full circle to my mother making us, you know, making us make sausage biscuits and PB and J's and give out after we open our gifts on Christmas. That's when I really started to see the why, you know, I look a thousand stamps, I look a thousand envelopes, but tell me why. And unfortunately, sometimes we don't tell our children the why we just make them do it. And it's not a bad thing, but, you know, it, it took some time that. Maybe that was planned, you know, um, mm -hmm. um, um, but in any case, I took on the community service chair, rolled alongside another uh, line brother of mine 
We planned out so many different events, male mentoring programs, educational reading Wednesdays, all these different opportunities to be a part of children and even young adult lives. So through that, Teach for America kind of came, it caught wind of like, you know, working on the business side of TFA, even after a teacher, as a recruiter, I, I figured out how they found me, but I'm glad they did. And big shout out to Crystal Daniels, because she's somebody who realized like, yo, you're, you're doing some things, you know, here's how that can align with doing it a little bit more, more impactfully and being around a child's life a little bit more than just on those Saturday mornings or Wednesday afternoons. So I took a leap of faith and I applied to Teach for America. One thing led to another. I'm in the final interview talking about the absence of black males and my my frustrations with rarely having a black male teacher. And here we are 10, 12 years later, you know. Um, so that opportunity just changed the course of my life from possibly working in a cubicle or drinking coffee, you know, to teaching children, you know, how to break down words, you know, and syntax and verb tense agreement. And it's just, again, a privilege to see how my life transitioned from that path of marketing and business to education. And from that experience, finding the nail to go in the coffin of saying, hey, yo, this was my frustration 20 years ago, not seeing black people on the covers of books. Why? Am I this teacher making 36 grand a year? Clearly, I can't afford books. So I'm going to go to the library. Why is the only thing that's available for them are nonfiction texts such as Frederick Douglass and LeBron James? It's dope. We could read about them all day. But for a 9 or 10-year-old, they're trying to hear a story. Yeah. They're trying to be inundated with life's happenings. Their life's happenings. Yes. So if we exclude what it is that we deprive them on how can we ever expect them to grow and to cherish and love literature and that is where i immediately realized that the lord has something greater for me and it took a little bit of my my mama like really like <laughs> stop playing and just write stop being scared and yeah yeah here we are thank you 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 gotta do it afraid you gotta go forth bravely with whatever it is so Absolutely. i'm glad your mom inspired you to do that Oh, yeah, she didn't play. She, yeah, she doesn't play. And she's a beautiful woman. She's a beautiful Delta as well. So I, I've been, I know, I love I know that how shout it goes. Out. Say hi to my soror. Thank I you. I know how it goes. I know how it goes. And it's just a yes, ma'am. And we make it happen. Now, I know you said that it's amazing to have your book on the nightstand of some kids' nightstand, right? And I think right. that is wonderful because some kid is, some young man is reading your books right now. So tell us, what is the book that you read when you were a child that had the greatest impact on you growing up? Oh, my gosh. Positive or negative? <laughs> because Either way. when you asked that question, it was Huckleberry Finn. Ooh. That lit the match. Mm -hmm. I was like, yo, why is he talking to this dude like this? Why is he talking mm -hmm. to the black guy like this? Like, why is he named? Did he just name call? Did I just read that with my eyes? It left a mark. Remember, oh, my Angelou, not what you say, how you make them feel. How that author made me feel in that moment. It was demonstrous. I realized that even in literature, they talk down on us. Even in text, we appear beneath others. And I could no longer, I didn't know at that time that I'd be blessed and privileged with the opportunity to write. I think to place a child in a position of doubt and not so much as while I appreciate the transparency of the time period and of what was going on in that moment, whether it was around them or whether it was in their controlled interests or not, I, I cannot stand for, I cannot stand for that experience to be pressed upon to other children. Children need to grow up in a way and they need to find a way to be cherished and championed. And I think in that moment, my race, my ethnicity, the hue of my skin was not championed. And I think that children need to continue to experience, you know, the opportunities that position them to really go forward in life. And they really need to be placed on uh, just, just some sort of royalty, because I think that is absent from countless students and countless readers. And I was certainly one of them as a child. But I knew that something had to be done. I just didn't think it would be me. <laughs> I didn't think I'd have 
you know, that privilege in life or that blessing to come down on me. Well, I'm going to say that I'm glad that it is, in fact, you, that it was placed on your heart and you decided to go forward with it. Because there's so many things that that we think about that God places us to do that we don't always follow through on. So I'm glad that you followed through on it because you now have books that while you were not seen at, you didn't see books, that particular book in your childhood as a positive, you have created books that champion our children, that show them positive images. And you have a large collected work that does exactly that that gives to other children what you did not receive in your experience with that particular book. So before we close, tell us where we can find all your books, Michael. Oh, you can. Um, thankfully, I've been picked up by Barnes and Nobles and Target and Walmart. So a lot of the major sellers and platforms online, um, you can simply Google my name, Michael Woodward Jr. Um, or you find one book, typically you'll find the rest of them. Uh, thankfully, somehow, some way, uh, a little bit more direct way to find me uh, is www.michaelwoodwardjr.com. Uh, so that's my author's website. Gives a little bit of background on who I am. Um, it also takes you to a place where you can purchase autograph copies of my literature. Um, so you'll see that through my custom apparel platform as well, through inspiredapparel.shop. So if you find me in one place, whether it's my Instagram at author M. Woodward Jr., um, you can find me in all of my other platforms. Um, so please j visit me, join me, reach out. Um, I do. I have no problem sending out sample copies. You know, I'm trying to make it in life. But at the same time, I understand that we need to get this literature in the hands of principals, um, resource, resources for, for teachers. I do have a curriculum coming out to go alongside King Monty 1 and 2. I'm on the cusp of King Monty 2 coming out just I don't want to say finish the cover, but we're still chiseling away. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so um, hopefully I can get it out by the summertime and make a few of these summer reading lists. Uh, but Egypt wasn't built in a day. Um, so we must continue to move forward in life and uh, just be thankful for every blessing uh, and, and every opportunity to continue to get ahead. And even those, the ones that push us back a bit, I think it's, it's okay. And children and adults need to continue to understand that it's okay to fail, but it is never acceptable to continue to not try at all. Wow, those are amazing and powerful words, Michael. I I want to thank you so much for spending the time talking with us. Um, we we started with your book, The Talk, and we covered all of your books and everything in between. And it, this has been such a filling, filling conversation to be able to have with you. So thank you so much for joining us. Again, uh, it was a privilege. You know, and I'm just thankful to just have this moment and for you to create this space uh, to continue on down this path uh, that I'll traverse upon until the day I die. Um, so no matter what stands before us or what stands before a child's life, I think it is a necessity. It is mandatory that we tell them that it's going to be OK and they're going to be able to make it through whatever it is they're going through. Never hesitate to stop a black child in the airport or, you know, in the mall and call him a king. And just keep it moving, you know? Um, yeah, it's part of the masses. So as we close the cover on this bookshelf gem, I would love to thank our author, Michael A. Woodward Jr. for taking the time to talk with us about his book, The Talk Conversations Between a Black Father and His Son. I would also like to thank you, our listeners, for joining us this week and joining us every week as we introduce new authors sharing their books. Until next time. Happy reading. Oh, yeah. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Authored by Us. Every author has a story to tell, and we enjoy bringing their stories to you each week. Whether you are listening as a young reader or are sharing this podcast with the young readers in your life, we are delighted to celebrate these stories inspired by diversity and shared in the voice of their authors. Follow us on social media at Authored by Us and subscribe to our podcast using your favorite podcast app. That way you never miss an episode. Have a gem on your bookshelf that we should have on ours? Visit us online at authoredbyus.com and let us know. Until next time, happy reading.